prepared for this evening. And it is as uh, we find ourselves in a, in a world that is a fallen world and we were born in sin and we were born in a battlefield when we're born again. And we have looked at so far the truths that show us that we are in a battle with sin. We are in a battle with the flesh. And this evening, we're going to look at the subject of being in a battle with the devil himself. And it's often called a spiritual warfare, which the battle we are in. And there are two primary errors when it comes to spiritual warfare. The first is an overemphasis, and the second is underemphasis. What I mean by that is the overemphasis is that some blame every sin and every conflict and every problem and trouble on the devil or on demons. And there are some that even go so far that any form of trouble in a person's life, any weakness is demonic and needs is needing to have a demon cast out. That's an overemphasis. Others completely ignore this, of course. They ignore the spiritual realm and the fact that the Bible tells us that we are indeed in a battle against spiritual powers. Now, the key to successful, and I always find it uh, strange to use terms like the key to success because that sounds so worldly, but uh, for spiritual warfare, we need to find a biblical balance. Jesus, as you read through the Gospels, we find sometimes would cast out demons out of people, but that's not what he spent his whole time doing. Other times he healed people, and he did so without any mention of, of demons being cast out. The Apostle Paul instructs us as Christians to wage that war against sin in Romans 6 and warns us to oppose the schemes of the devil. And so there is that, again, as we looked at before, there is that sin or that war that we wage with within ourselves against the sin. And when we fail to war against it, we're the ones held accountable for it. But on the other hand, a balanced view also reminds us that there are the schemes of the devil that we need to be aware of and keep on guard. Now, to better understand this combat, we're going to turn to the passage that I know that probably many of you can know from uh, start to finish, and that's Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth. Have on the breastplate of righteousness, and having on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
Now, before we go back to the previous verses of starting at verse 10, I want you to note that we read verse 18. Quite often when that passage dealing with being uh, strong in the Lord, standing fast and having the armor of God upon, say it's uh, written in on a, on a card or, or it's uh, or even in a devotional, quite often that verse 18 is not mentioned. But this verse on prayer is a foundation for us when it comes to standing strong against the wiles of the devil and standing with the armor of God upon us. We cannot do this without prayer. So we're always to be in prayer. And that should be our, our, uh, our motto, pray and pray without ceasing. Now we learn clearly that we are in a battle with the devil. And this is another important reason why we need to daily and moment by moment be people of prayer. I say that because there are those that seem to think that it's all right to talk to the devil when they're, when they're uh, in the battle against him. But I don't believe that's a wise thing for us. I believe when we are standing against the, the wiles of the devil, we should not be talking to him. We should be talking to the Lord. We should be in prayer, seeking him and seeking his help. And so going back to, to verse 10, we see that we're to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so this is, this is the reminder of the truth that we cannot do this in our own strength. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the power and ability of ourselves. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And we come into this verse 11, and this is where we will kind of slow down a bit, where we're told to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. Now, here are a couple things for us to remember about the devil. As we see here in this verse, as well as in other portions of scripture, the devil is real. Probably one of the, the great... Uh, deceptions of the devil is to have people either not believe he exists or not believe that he is a troublemaker or just view him as some kind of cartoon character. But we know that the scripture does not display him as a cartoon character. He is a real being. He's a real, real uh, creature. And what we have to understand, too, as we'll see in a couple of verses, is that he is, just like you and just like me, he is a creation of God. That God is the one who created him. The Lord Jesus is the creator of the devil. And because of that, when we come to the Lord in prayer and we're seeking his strength and power to stand strong and stand fast against him, we can know then that because he is a creation, that he's created, that means he is not God. And that also means he is not omnipresent. Uh, Satan doesn't have that ability to be everywhere at once as God is everywhere. He is also not omniscient. He does not know everything. And in fact, I would say he knows less than we probably think he knows. He is also not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. There's only one who is all-powerful, and that is God. Jesus said that all power has been given to him in heaven and in earth. So the devil is not omnipotent. He is also a defeated creature. And one of the things that scripture teaches us is that he knows that he is a defeated creature. You, you, the, the demons as well know that because you remember when Jesus was confronted by some who were demon possessed, the demons cried out, have you come to, to, uh, to judge us at this time before the time to cast us out? They, they knew that they were under his judgment. Well, 
Satan knows his time is short. It says this in Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And so that's one thing he does know. When we talk about combat with this creature, this creation of God, this combat with the devil, we have to be careful here to not become what, what might be termed as the devil slayer. The devil slayer. A friend of ours down the state, say, they asked uh, us this past week if we could check out for them uh, a so-called bishop who has some sort of ministry in Toronto, Ontario. So we looked up his website and looked at uh, what some of the things he say on it. And uh, first of all, I, I thought most often today, even though we know that in scripture it uh, uses the term bishop, quite often when somebody uses the term bishop today, it doesn't mean the same thing as in the Bible. And this was the case with this person because he believed that he was a bishop called of God and claims that he has been chosen by God to destroy the works of the devil. Now, as powerful as that may sound, it's dangerous because of the fact that, uh, well, first of all, uh, he could be guilty of uh, copyright infringement because Jesus is the one that says that, or that's, that's what's said about Jesus in the Bible. 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so it's the Lord Jesus. He came into this world. His purpose was to destroy the works of the devil. And it was it's not our calling. It's not our position and ability to destroy the works of the devil. It's Christ who has that. And so if anybody claims that they're the chosen one to do that, then of course... They're, they're claiming to be like, like Jesus. And in fact, further into his website, he talked about uh, this, this mystical idea of Christ consciousness and the idea that you can be as Christ on earth. So very dangerous. Now, when it comes to the battle with the devil... Saying that, we know, as Scripture teaches us, we're not to take on the role that belongs to Christ alone. And it's only Jesus who has that power to defeat the devil. So even when we, as verse 10 says, when we're strong in the Lord, the power of his might, and we have the whole armor of God to stand against the walls of the devil, it's not by our might, it's not by our power that the walls of the devil are push back in a way it's through christ because only jesus christ has the authority and the power to to defeat the devil which he has already crushed his head but with that the balance of it is that we are still called to stand against the wiles of the devil another portion tells us to resist the devil he will flee from us uh, this indicates that not every time you're tempted or facing troubles, you are, are battling Satan himself, though. Because, again, remember, he's not omnipresent. But you're standing against, as it says, the schemes. Note that in that verse 11. Against the schemes of the devil. And the schemes of the devil, they come in different ways, different forms, different ideas, uh, wiles or schemes or tricks, their manipulations, their deceptions. Now, Scripture gives us insight into our enemy's tactics with these schemes. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 2.11, we are not unaware of his schemes. And uh, here are some of the devil's wiles that we see in in uh, scripture and the first is one of the schemes of the devil is to challenge the 
veracity, the truthfulness of God's word. Uh, Genesis 3, you recall when, when he, the serpent tempted Eve. It gives us details there with the tactics of the enemy where he led the first uh, human to sin, to disobey God by using scripture, challenging the truthfulness of God's word, of what God had said. Remember in Genesis 3, 1, it says, did God really say? The second thing is the, the wiles or the schemes of the devil challenge our identity. That is a, not just who I am as Daryl say, but our identity as a, a Christian, our identity in Christ. Uh, it, often this happens when, most often, when we're facing some sort of crisis, we're maybe going through some spiritual struggle and you know, the, the doubts that can come into the, our minds. You know, if you were a child of God, this would never happen to you. Or if you're actually a Christian, God would do a miracle and help you right now. And, and that's, that basically is a challenge of our identity as the children of God that, that challenges the truth that God loves us and cares for us as, as a, a father. Uh, Satan did this in the temptation in the wilderness. On two occasions, Satan began the temptation with these words. If you are the son of God, if you are God's son, you know, Satan knew exactly who Jesus was. Uh, the devil, though in that time when Jesus was physically weak, he was hungry, he used that to in the temptation attack if you are the son of god and that's often what happens with us if you are a child of god if you are a christian why is this happening the third one kind of similar to the first of challenging god's word is twisting god's word twisting scripture uh, the the devil actually used this one as well in the temptation in the wilderness he quoted scripture, but he did it with a kind of a twist with it. Uh, it's, uh, I'll just quickly read that. It's Luke chapter 4, just so you hear the, the twisting of scripture. Luke chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Where am I here? Verse 10 says, For it is written... That's uh, that Satan talking about. It's written in the, the Bible. It's written in the Old Testament. He's saying, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in your in their hands, they will bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. So he's saying, this is what it's written in the Bible. But of course, he's twisting it to, to uh, deceive. Also, it... He's basically taking from one of the beautiful uh, books of the Bible, Psalm 91 is where he's taken that from. And he's, again, he's seeking to take and use what is true, but use it and twist it to deceive. And we, we see that often today. We can see it, say, for example, with prosperity teachers, false prophets, they quote scripture uh, and they do it just to to get people to follow them and to uh, give them money you know and all those sorts of things just do so in a misleading way they use enough words that sound and even are taken out of the bible to sound right to sound authoritative but it's their twisting of it and and the scriptures that are twisted uh, bring judgment and bring uh, damnation as as the apostle taught later on. The fourth one is offering a tempting alternative to obedience to God. That's another scheme. It's used in the 
again in the temptation of Jesus, when he said, see all the kingdoms of this world. If you, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you these kingdoms. Basically, tempting alternative to obedience. Rather than for Jesus to go to the cross in obedience to the Father, just Satan says, bow down and worship me, and you won't have to go through all that. And uh, Satan knew better, though, because I'm sure he knew that Jesus wouldn't fall for that. One of the most sinister wiles of the devil, schemes of the devil, involves his ability to offer compromise and present it as a, a beautiful religious spiritual experience. You know, uh, the New Testament writers were often calling the people of God, that is us even to this day, not to compromise, not to compromise the truth. But uh, there are those who fall to this idea. Well, I, uh, they'll say, well, I don't need doctrine. All I want to do is love everybody. And that's a compromise. That's basically saying I, I want all the fluff of, of spirituality and of religion, but I don't want to take a stand for truth. We're not to compromise. That's a sinister wiles of the devil. Uh, just a couple thoughts here. Uh, we won't turn to all these portions of scripture, but I'll just give the the uh, addresses to them. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. But the those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the New Testament often pointed out some of the wiles of the devil to those in the church because there are many falling for them. And this included the presence of false prophets, false prophets in the church. First Timothy chapter 6 Verse three and five, three through five warns us against false prophets. Just because somebody says, I have a word from the Lord, this is the word of God, does not make them a true prophet of God. The presence of false prophets. Uh, this next one is uh, busybodies. And that's from 1 Peter 4, verse 15. There are those who would just. Uh, you know, they just go around from house to house being busybodies, getting into everybody's business, but but the, the Lord's business. And so he warned the church. They warned the church about those like that. And also, he warned, we're warned in Scripture that there are those who are seducers, seducers in the church. Revelation 2, verse 20. Three. Seducers, of course, are those that, you know, they talk sugar coating. They talk sweet. They talk in such a way that it, it is uh, appealing to the, the mind and the ears and the senses. But that's the way, again, also of the false teachers and the false prophets. And we're warned against those. And that's... The, that's the schemes of the devil. The Bible tells us that, that uh, the devil himself presents himself as an angel of light. And so that's another scheme of the devil, presenting himself as the truth, as the true way. And this is who we are in a conflict with, or what we are in a conflict with, the schemes, the, the wiles, the deceptions of the devil. It's what we are to stand strong against and seek the strength and power of the Lord to stand strong. And so when we speak in terms of this conflict, I believe we must remove from it that it's simply a fight with the devil himself. Because it's the Lord himself that is, a, a, is the one that goes in to fight against the devil himself. Our calling is to stand against his schemes and resist 
his temptations and leave the victory in the hands of the Lord. But what this shows to us is the nature of this battle. I'd like us to note back in Ephesians chapter 6, I'd like us to note in particular verse 12. Ephesians 6 verse 12, again, reading that again, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This verse begins with a negative. Note that. For we wrestle not. Does not mean we do not wrestle. There's indeed a great wrestle, sometimes more difficult than other times, sometimes more dangerous, but indeed we do wrestle in the Christian life. Otherwise, there would not be an exhortation, as it says in verse 10, to be strong in the Lord, verse 11, to stand against and stand dressed in the whole armor of God. But the negative statement leads us to the type of battle we are wrestling in. Note, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So Paul, he's stressing here that for the believer, the battle is not a physical one, but a spiritual one. Uh, must add this thought, though. At times, flesh and blood gets involved, uh, such as those who come as apostles of light, but they are not, but they're they are under the, that spiritual banner. It's, it's, uh, we might have that physical involvement when the church is persecuted, say, in the world. But still, it's not flesh and blood that is the character and nature of this battle. So we must not forget that Christian warfare consists of a spiritual battle. Therefore, we need a spiritual strategy that's fought with spiritual weapons against a spiritual enemy. The opposition is real, but it's not visible to the, the naked eyes. It's that invisible spiritual battle that's raging. We fight this war, again, but not with physical weapons. Uh, we don't fight with, uh, with the guns and ammunition or swords or whatever weapons are of whatever time period the church, it, all, all through history, uh, there has been this, this, these times in which uh, the church became, especially the apostate church, became more of a, of a uh, worldly army than a spiritual army. And they used the arms of flesh rather than the spiritual weapons were given. It's uh, the weapons were shown here is the whole armor of God. Always praying. Always standing firm in the word of God, staying alert, having faith, uh, trusting in the salvation of the Lord, and the truth, proclaiming the gospel. This is the spiritual weaponry. Now, if we do not fight against flesh and blood, what and whom are we wrestling with? Who are our spiritual enemies? Well, we've already kind of mentioned a bit already, but verse 11 does mention the devil again, or the schemes of the devil. He is indeed our enemy. In verse 12, he reveals the four others, or basically this can all be combined as one, but it's, pre it's presented in these four sections. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Now here in Ephesians and other parts of the scripture, the Christian life is pictured as being that warfare of a kingdom against another kingdom. We know we are in the kingdom of light. We're in warfare against the kingdom of darkness. Uh, we're depicted as soldiers in this battle gear, as we see here in this portion of Ephesians 6. We're standing in defense of the kingdom of God against that kingdom of darkness. Now, this here gives us somewhat of a description of the kingdom of darkness. These statements or these titles that we see in this verse 12. Uh, note that they are, again, not a physical earthly army, but it's spiritual again in nature. Uh, the phrase that Paul calls them, first of all, principalities and powers. This statement occurs six times in the Bible, and it can be translated as rulers, as authorities, forces, uh, rulers and powers. And uh, in most places where the phrase appears, what uh, is kind of in the context of it, is that it refers to this vast array of evil and malicious uh, spiritual uh, powers that are making war against the people of God. So the principalities and powers are of that kingdom of darkness and all, also of this world, this fallen world we're in. The principalities and powers of Satan are usually in view here who brings that uh, that it comes opposing, opposing the kingdom of God, opposing the righteousness, opposing the people of God, opposing everything and everyone that is of God and all the works and activities of the kingdom of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just mention a couple verses where this kind of brings it out for us in in a clearer way, Colossians 1 and verse 16. And here is where we see again that the devil himself is a creation of God, as well as all the demons, all as well as all the angels that remained with, with God in heaven. Colossians 1 verse 16, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So all things. All, here's a clear statement that God is the creator and ruler over all authorities, whether they submit to him or rebel against him. They still are under his feet. And whatever power the evil forces possess, they don't have control over God. They don't have, they don't have one inch of victory over Christ and his kingdom. And we can, we can hold that and believe that and find comfort in that, even in the midst of the, the greatest of trials that come against a Christian, come against the church. This is a... I'm sure a comforting truth to those who are uh, persecuted in some of the countries that we've prayed for in the last few, number of weeks, where God is over and sovereign over all these powers that be. And they are under him, under his feet, under his power. In the next chapter of Colossians, we read about Jesus and his ultimate power over all these powers. It says, and having spoiled principalities of powers, sorry, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The Lord spoiled these principalities and powers that we are in Ephesians to, told to stand against. And our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against these. And so when you're a Christian and when you're in the armor of God, remember that that enemy is already a defeated foe. He's under the, 
the, the feet of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoiled them. He crushed them. He's made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That's a picture of, of when a Roman so general would win a victory over another uh, nation. They would take the rulers of that nation and they would parade them into Rome and they would show them off. These are our captives. We've, 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 we now dominate over them. We are sovereign over them. We're the powers that are sovereign with absolute power. We've spoiled them. This is what Jesus has done with the, the kingdom of darkness, the principalities and powers. And so in keeping with this, the powers are created by Christ and they are under his control. They are under his feet. They're not to be feared then. They are, they are enemies or the kingdom of darkness, the principalities and powers have been dis disarmed by the cross by the Savior, by his death. Scripture says that when Jesus ascended, he took cap up from the grave, he took captivity captive, took dominion from those who had the powers. Satan and his legions had been cast down, as the Bible says, that the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. Christ, by his death, subdued the invaders, recaptured those who had, had uh, gone against uh, the, the, the truth of Christ and the truth of the gospel and the people of God. There's a wonderful truth to remember because of the fact we know, the Bible teaches us still, that the enemy does go about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That doesn't deny the fact that he's already defeated lion. The Bible tells us that, that he's under his, the feet of Christ and that there will be that ultimate bringing of him under his feet when he comes again and he casts him into the lake of fire. Now, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 6 again. says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Sorry, I'm in the wrong book. There we are. In verse 12, we read again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, where it says, he adds that we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world. It's uh, noted as it states there. Uh, it's against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Rulers of the darkness of the world, again, it reveals that spiritual nature of the battle. Uh, he also adds spiritual wickedness in heavenly or high places from the, the Greek, the spiritual, uh, the wickedness in high places can also be said as hosts, wicked hosts, wicked army. The spiritual wicked army, uh, this is who we stand against. The battle is against. But we see here at most importantly, it's just defining the nature and character of the enemy we stand against. It's not of the physical world. It is spiritual in na nature. It's wicked. It's evil in character. Totally opposite to the character and nature of the kingdom of God, which is righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. These terms or titles indicate that the, the devil and the demons kind of are pictured as an army and that he leads a host of demonic soldiers, as it were, the fallen angels, and their, uh, their desire is to deceive and 
And Revelation again tells us that his desire is to bring wrath and destruction upon the lives and in the lives and hearts of, of people of the world, the fallen, the lost. And this is who we are, are now called out of and delivered from and called now to stand against all that wickedness, stand against all that darkness. 1 John 5.19 says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. This is the world we live in. It lies in wickedness. Jesus in John 12.31 says that Satan was the ruler of this world. Jesus came to cast him out. So we know who we're battling against. We also know our enemy, who we are battling against. Again, I, I, I just keep emphasizing it because I believe this is an important truth that, that encourages us as we face the trials of the enemy, the testings of the enemy, is that this enemy is already defeated. Jesus has crushed him and will one day come and cast him and all the fallen angels into hell. And therefore, we not only stand strong in the power of the Lord, but we stand fast with the confidence in the Lord. Confidence in Christ Jesus. This is, this is the, the conclusion or summary for us that I'd like to share because we've only touched on the character and nature of this warfare, who we are fighting against, and uh, we'll, Lord willing, uh, next time really get in into those weapons and, and how we are to stand and how we are to fight. But the enemy whom the Christian is to fight, again, it's, it's not flesh and blood. That's why when you see somebody, say, on the street who uh, maybe bumps into you and does so, and you know they did it on purpose, uh, you don't turn around and punch them in the face because it's not a fight in the flesh and blood. The enemy is spiritual. The warfare is spiritual. And again, even though it's spiritual, there is a real foe. It's not just a, it's not just a philosophy or a psychology or whatever you might uh, call it. It is there is a real living foe, the devil, who we stand against. He leads and he directs the powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this world. The nature of it is sin. The nature of it is wickedness. The enemy has schemes. But to stand against it, we are to stand against it in the power of Christ. And knowing the enemy, again, Lord willing, we'll look at ways we do stand in the power of Christ against him. But until then, we're to stand fast in the full armor of God. So I'd like to read those again, and then, again, Lord willing, we will go deeper into these next time. Again, this is the portion we've been looking at. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication 
for all saints. Let's stand fast in that armor and resist the devil and he will flee. Someone wrote, I've enlisted for life in the army of the Lord. Though the fight may be long and the struggle fierce and hard, with the armor of God and the spirit's trusty sword, at the front of the battle you will find me. With the banner of love and of holiness unfurled, full salvation proclaimed to a sinful dying world. Though the darts thick and fast from the enemy be hurled, at the front of the battle you will find me. May we be at the front of the battle with Christ and standing fast, standing strong in his power. Amen. Just going to ask, and I, I know this might be a challenge because uh, we tried last week, but um, Bob, can you try again to see if you can unmute your phone? Maybe that you tried something last week. possible let's wait and see for a moment and if so then uh, I'd like to ask you to pray and just ask the Lord to give us strength against the enemy to stand strong in his word let's see if I can unmute you It's not working. Sorry, I'm going to have to get you to pray right away next time. So keep that in mind. <laughs> um, let's see. Narendra, would you please have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing and strength as we stand fast in him against the wiles of the devil? Thank you. Father, it's a great privilege, Lord, to uh, be able to come to the throne of grace. And uh, knowing that we are in presence of the God of the universe, the ruler, the one who owns the life of everyone. And uh, we praise you, Lord. We love you and we, uh, we love your uh, faithful love yes. from the beginning to our people. We never leave or forsake our people. And even we go through trial, persecution, with the wiles of the devil, the warfare is real. We know that you are on the throne. You are, we are in your hand, O oh Lord. And, uh, he will uh, keep us in your hand. No one can pluck us out of your hand. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for uh, Jesus Christ, for what he has done for us. Yeah. Shedding his blood, cleaning us from all unrighteousness, bringing us to the marvelous light. That you may understand your word, that you may... Uh, have the sight to look to him and uh, thank you for your work in our life day by day sanctifying us that you may walk closer to christ for this time oh lord we think of uh, russ that uh, you may uh, strengthen him may our peace be with him even through this time yes your joy joy of salvation knowing that uh, even if we leave this place, this pilgrim place, we know that we have a better place mm -hmm. that you prepare for us as you promise. And uh, thank you, Lord, for your peace, your comfort, even through time of trial. We pray for Lynn, mm -hmm. as you will, that you may touch her body and uh, that she may uh, get healed. 
And uh, I pray for the church, for Sovereign Grace but this Church, that you may strengthen each one of us, even through this time. Uh, so that you may pray for each other. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 The Lord bless, Lord bless you. If, uh, if before you go, and if you have video available, just turn your video on and wave goodbye. So we can see, we can see your smiling faces. <laughs> there. Hello. Cool. Yes. Oh, I hear some happy voices in the background. Hello. That's great. Well, thank you all for joining in and praying and studying the Word of God together. You know that we have victory in the Lord. Again, it was a great message, though. Thanks, Robert. Lord bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Lord bless you, Mike. Okay, well, take care, everybody, and uh, see you on Sunday, I guess. Yes. Okay. Good night. Yeah, pray, for that, pray that the sun will still come out on Sunday. Yeah. You know, I, I went for a walk today. Ah. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you know where I had to secondary is, right? Yep. Yeah, I went for a walk with my dad. Oh, great. Yeah. That's great. You can have a New, renewed relationship with your dad. That's great. Yeah. That's great. It brought it brought lo lots of memories when I saw that school. Oh yeah. Because I was there what for five years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as I was walking by, um, I recognized the uh, some of the uh, uh, rooms, you know, classrooms, you yeah. know. I took biology, chemistry, I took electronics, I took, uh, you know, uh, Japanese, and I also took some other courses. And as, as I was walking by, I was able to identify each of those, <laughs> each of those class or rooms, you know. And, uh, yeah. yeah, for those that might not know, uh, Robert's dad used to own the little grocery store out in Hatsik. Yeah. By the by, the high school there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Pretty close. Oh, it's by about, about, about a block or two away. Pub was there? I don't know. I didn't hear the pub. There, there was a pub there beside yeah. Sister's yeah. Pub. Or, yeah. yeah. That now, now that store, it's 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 turned into a a, a pizza. Um, That's true. I don't oh. know, like a pizza restaurant or something. It's. Huh. It's like a half of it is a grocery store, and then the other half is like a, a restaurant. They, huh. they they sell pizza, they sell chicken wings, some pastas. Huh. Yeah. So your dad was able to sell off the store then, or? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. He's retired. And well, he, has, he has so lots good. of time. He has lots yeah. of time, free time on his hands. <laughs> he doesn't know. He, he doesn't know what to do with it. Thank you, stop. Pastor. I guess, I guess I should stop the recording because it's getting everybody just talking here. Is is this going to be uploaded on YouTube? Yeah. So we're going to hear all about you. everybody <laughs> in the world. Is going to hear. <laughs> yeah.